In this presentation, we will listen to examples of early blues recordings that represent some of the dominant characteristics of the musical form. In this class, we will be distinguishing early blues from the later classic blues form that develops in the 1920s and 1930s. We will discuss ways of defining classic blues later. The early blues is often called country blues or delta blues. The Delta Blues were performed by musicians who primarily lived in the Mississippi Delta region. This was an agricultural region consisting of many small towns where blues musicians played guitar and sang on porches and in juke joints. The music developed after the Civil War and grew in popularity throughout the rural South at the turn of the century. Many of the recordings we have of Delta Blues performers were made in the 1920s and 1930s by folk music collectors who traveled the South making field recordings of the local and regional musicians. As Leroy Jones, who later changed his name to Amiri Baraka, indicates in his book Blues People, much can be learned about the social conditions and issues facing African Americans in their own time and place by listening to the music they made. We will put that theory to the test by listening closely to several blues recordings. The development of the country blues marked a shift away from previous musical forms used by African American slaves. The common forms before the Civil War included field holler and work songs. Field hollers were vocalized shouts, often following a call and response pattern. One voice would lead and a chorus of voices would call out in response. This tradition continues in many African American church services where the pastor preaches and the congregation responds with affirmative shouts. A field holler often was sung in mournful tones, a characteristic that can be heard in blues songs as well. Rhythm might be supplied by foot stomps, hand claps, vocalizations like the uh sound interjected between phrases. Field hollers were often sung while working in the fields, so the tempo typically was quite methodical and slow. As you can imagine, picking cotton in the south in the summer is hard work, so the slow and steady pace of the music fit the task. If tools were used in particular tasks, these might also be used to keep the beat. Work songs sung by slaves often followed the ballad style of European songs. A ballad, in this case meaning a song that tells a story, often uses the same melody over and over again for each verse until the story comes to a conclusion. The slaves often used these songs as opportunities to communicate with one another in code. While the slave master looked on, slaves could sing a biblical tale about the Israelites in Egypt crossing the Jordan to get away from the Pharaoh. Such a song could operate then as a hidden message for the slaves. It expressed the desire to escape the master's plantation and cross the river to the promised land of freedom. Since the work songs sung in the days of slavery were not recorded, our best listening examples come from field recordings made of prison chain gangs. We're going to listen to three country blues songs, paying attention to the characteristic of field hollers and work songs, as well as the patterns commonly found in the blues. The first is Tom Russian Blues by Charlie Patton. Because country blues developed as an individualized art form performed not for a mass audience but for local communities, there are a few people in the story of this song that you will not know. Since you weren't living in rural Mississippi in 1929, you'll need a little background information to help you decipher the story. The song has four characters, the singer, Charlie Patton, his friend, Holloway, Tom Day, and Tom Rushing. If it's not clear in the song, it helps to know that Tom Rushing, whose name was probably mistranscribed by Paramount Records, was the deputy sheriff and Tom Day was the marshal. 
Listen to the song from beginning to end, following along with the lyrics in order to understand the story Patton is telling. The first thing you should have noticed is the AAB pattern of the verses. This is the typical blues form. The first line sets the pattern as A and is repeated, followed by a new third line B. And this is a story song following the European ballad style. But it is a personal individual story, which is one of the foundational characteristics of blues music. By the end of the second verse, we can infer that the singer is in jail and is about to tell us how he got there. Patton's clever use of language in verse 3 suggests, however, that not everything is as it seems. It would appear Patton was hauled off to jail for possessing moonshine, something that was illegal in 1929. The third line of verse 3 raises some questions, though, because of the wording, Mr. Day brought whiskey taken from under Holloway's head. Might it be that Patton is actually innocent, since it was his friend Holloway who had the whiskey? And did the marshal, Mr. Day, actually bring the whiskey himself and plant it on Holloway, a common practice of corrupt, corrupt police who want to find a reason to put someone in jail? Patton mourns his situation in the next verse claiming that the only way to cure his, his blues is booze, and he can't have it in jail. The dark joke here is that the very thing that brought him to jail is what he needs the most now that he's in jail. The next verse adds another piece to the story, with the realization that Marshal Tom Day is running for office, and what's a better way to win an election than to show you are tough on crime? The punchline comes in the last verse, then. While we might expect Patton to wish Day loses the election so he's forced to run from town to town like a poor blues man, Patton surprises us by campaigning for Tom Day instead. Let me tell you folks just how he treated me. He caught me, and I was drunk. This is a comedic line played in the tradition of the minstrel show. The story questions the purity of Tom Day's motives and methods, while admitting to the singer's own role in helping get Day elected. Patton is willing to play the fool in order to undermine those in power, just as many of the best minstrel performers played up their stupidity in order to reveal the foolishness of the upper class. The second blues song we'll look at is That Black Snake Moan by Blind Lemon Jefferson. You will be able to hear the field holler mournfulness in Jefferson's voice. This again is a very personal story, but it is even more impressionistic than Tom Russian blues. Jefferson's song also represents the gritty and overt sexuality expressed in blues music. It's important to be able to recognize the use of sexual innuendo because this is what many teenagers found enticing about rock and roll which developed out of this blues tradition. In this song, we see the snake used as a phallic symbol. The pain heard in Jefferson's voice is one of sexual frustration, but also the pain of a broken relationship that seems related to their economic poverty. Mama, of course, is slang for his woman. She's referred to as sugar in verse 3 when he asks her for money but she replies with lemon at the end of the line, a nice play off Jefferson's nickname that succinctly defines their relationship as the opposition of bitter and sweet. We'll end our close look at country blues songs with one of the most well-known of the Delta blues players, Robert Johnson. Because of Johnson's mysteriously short life, he has taken on mythic proportions. In fact, the song we'll analyze is often interpreted in support of one of the most popular myths that Robert Johnson sold his soul to the devil at the crossroads to gain success. His unique guitar playing style was highly influential on many rock and roll musicians, 
and he's still hugely popular today. While listening to Crossroad Blues, pay attention to the story Johnson is telling. The crossroad imagery is used effectively to produce a feeling of imminent doom. Not only is Johnson standing in the middle of two roads, a symbol of a decisive moment where he could go one of two directions, he's also at the crossroad between day and night, and, it's implied, life and death. He feels he's sinking down with the sun. It's important to take note of the year this song was recorded, 1936. Around this time, it was still common for blacks to be lynched by whites in the South. The main character of the song is clearly distraught that he's alone in an unfamiliar place as it's getting dark and he could be in great danger. The picture Johnson paints with his words and with his voice is eerie and haunting. In 1991, John Hammond narrated a documentary about the life of Robert Johnson. In the documentary, Hammond tries to uncover the man behind the myth. He interviews people who knew Johnson growing up, and even has a conversation with one of Johnson's old girlfriends. The documentary is an excellent look at the world of the blues singer in the Mississippi Delta. <laughs> 